we hear of the dangers of pollution of the seas from shipping, which despite legislation and recommendations is still a very serious problem. In the past 10 years, there have been marked improvements in ship design and equipment, and internationally agreed measures for the control of illegal discharges have been widely adopted. Yet, violations and polluting still continue, leading to prosecutions and heavy fines for those responsible. But can ships really cause such a problem, some of you may ask? The answer is yes. The sea is not merely seven-tenths of the Earth's surface, enabling us to travel and transport goods from place to place. It also supplies a tremendous amount of food, upon which millions of people depend. But because of pollution, the habitat of vast numbers of marine creatures has been seriously threatened, not only in waters close to land, but also in the open oceans. Then, if the pollution is so bad, why on earth is it taking place? It is in large part caused by lack of awareness by individual officers and crew members who seem to look upon the oceans as a huge sink capable of dealing with almost anything put into it. For a moment, think of the atmosphere surrounding the Earth, much larger than the oceans, yet its pollution is taking place. CFC from aerosols and refrigerants is said to be causing a hole in the ozone layer. There's a strong possibility that carbon dioxide from cars and the burning of coal and oil for heating is causing a warming of the Earth's climate, which may result in a rise in the levels of the oceans with cities submerged and coastlines eroded. But we're talking about pollution by shipping. How can very small quantities of substances make serious changes to the oceans? The answer is that it's really a matter of multiplication. There are approximately 70,000 ships sailing the seas, all with the potential to add some pollution. The discharge of relatively small quantities of waste, repeated in thousands of places day by day, year after year, adds up to something very significant. And many of the substances which pollute are highly persistent, and in the case of most plastics, are non-biodegradable. Some of the chemical pollutants are highly toxic, and mercury, for instance, is absorbed and remains in some marine organisms, making them poisonous to whoever or whatever eats them. Look at this for a moment. Clear, clean water being poured into a large glass container. As seen through a microscope, some particles of pollutant are dropped into the water. Rapidly, they start to spread. Now the pollutant is spreading more and more. Soon it will affect all the water. And of course, this substance could be a deadly poison, a killer, and the minute grains have contaminated a water volume perhaps a million times their own size. And here, on board ship, we see how a small amount of oil has polluted a stream of water. The oceans have existed in one form or another for millions of years, but it's only in the last 50 years or so that oily waste and toxic materials have been poured into those oceans in considerable and increasing quantities. Well, yes, you may admit, so we are polluting the seas, but what, as seamen, can we do about it? We're permitted to let minute and carefully controlled amounts of pollutant into the sea in certain areas, but we don't deliberately go around pouring poisons overboard or discharging oil and waste into the sea. Of course not, but that's just the point. Most of the pollution is not deliberate, although regrettably, some of it is. Optimistic belief in the ocean's ability to absorb and neutralize pollutants is commonplace. Angry seas churning up the stuff, breathing air into the water, oxygenation, helps with some pollutants, but only to a degree. So let's look at the problem to see how pollution does occur and what can and must be done to tackle the menace. And realize you are involved. There are rules, recommendations and penalties relevant to all types of pollution from ships, large and small. But ultimately, it's up to the master and his crew, the officers, the managers and the owners to see that everything possible is done. For one thing, every ship should have an environmental policy. 
and an officer dedicated to seeing that that policy is followed. The legislation involved concerns MARPOL, which is dealt with in some detail in the support book for this video. Oil is a source of ship-generated pollution at sea, much of which is derived from three-quarters of the incidents that occur on any type of ship during routine operations, such as the pumping of bilges and deballasting of cargo tanks. However, some of the most frequent causes of oil spillage and pollution are concerned with hoses, connection flanges, and blanking off. And this applies to the bunkering of even the smallest vessels. With bunkering, it's necessary to follow a bunkering checklist, ticking off each item as checked. If your ship hasn't such a list, one should be prepared from the procedures you know. The accompanying book can also help. Checklists for bunkering or fuel transfer vary to some extent, but in general they'll ask, have communications been established with shore or barge personnel? And has agreement been reached on maximum loading rates, maximum working pressure, and loading quantities? This procedure may take place in many different parts of the world, and language difficulties have to be taken into account. Is the ship securely moored and fended? A small point, but could be very serious if she's not. Are deck scuppers positively plugged before starting operations? This is of course so that in case of a spill, the fuel will not run straight off the deck and pollute the sea. Sometimes, on different types of ships, to make absolutely certain that no oil leaks around the scupper plugs, the openings are temporarily blocked with rags and covered with quick-drying cement or plaster. Are means readily available on the ship to help deal with oil spills, such as the provision of rags, cotton waste, absorbent granules, sawdust and absorbent pads. Empty oil drums and scoops may also be provided. Are drip trays below the bunker manifold connections clean and free from clogging material? Are tank isolating valves which are not in use properly set and blank flanges fitted where necessary and oil tight? Has the bunker line system been properly checked and lined up? When the bunkering operation actually commences, check that the various hoses and connections are oil tight under pressure and that the oil is supplying the intended tank and also that there's no leak to the sea. Regrettably, however, despite all precautions, oil leaks can and do occur. And the golden rule is that they must be dealt with promptly and the oil prevented from actually going over the side and causing pollution. To contain a spillage within a small area of the deck, a wall of absorbent material can be formed. Sawdust or the specially prepared granules will be fine. In some cases, the oil absorbent packs can be put to good use. In the case of a larger spill, a portable air-driven pump can be used to pump the oil into a large empty oil drum for safe disposal. When cleaning up after a leak or spill, sawdust or the granules are useful, but when oily, they must not be swept over the side, but carefully collected up and put into heavy-duty bags. These will have to be retained either for incineration on board, if not plastic, or for shore disposal. Organic material, such as sawdust, oily rags and cotton waste, need special attention because they are liable to spontaneously ignite. If there's no incinerator on board, the material should be safely stored in metal bins for disposal at the next shore facility. The engine room of any ship is always a potential source of pollution, in general resulting from minor leakages within the system, which can contaminate water in the bilges, which, if pumped out without treatment, will cause pollution. Drip trays are frequently provided beneath components liable to oil leakage, with pipes running to the dirty bilge or sludge tank. Water in an engine room sometimes leaks and becomes oily. A separator can remove traces of oil contamination down to below 100 parts per million. But for clean water, under the Marpole Convention, figures of less than 15 parts per million are required and usually an additional filtering system is provided to achieve this. 
Many use disposable filter cartridges, which must be changed when saturated. On deck, oil may collect in the winch beds and may leak from hydraulic lines. On tankers, it is again essential to pre-plan loading or unloading operations and to strictly follow company procedures and checklists. The establishment of communications between ship and shore, details of the maximum loading rate, working pressure and loading quantities will all be agreed and language difficulties must be taken into account to make sure that what is agreed is really understood by all parties. As when bunkering, during cargo operations, the scuppers must be plugged. If it rains heavily, the appropriate plugs must be removed to drain off excessive water, but they must be replaced immediately when the water has drained away. As a safeguard, granules, sawdust, cotton waste scoops and so on should all be available, just as when bunkering. We see here oil dispersant, but in many countries this may only be used after permission has been granted by their authorities, so it should not be included among disposable materials except for deck cleaning after a spillage. In the event of a considerable spillage, a portable air-driven pump is valuable, with a hose running to a large drum. As a precaution, before loading or unloading start, the drip trays beneath the manifolds need checking for cleanliness. The officer in charge will ensure that the pipeline system is correctly lined up and that no drain or washing connections have been left open. The closing of manifold valves and the blanking of connections not in use must be checked. The connection between the ship and the shore is always a high-risk place for leakage, so it must be inspected carefully, and a man should be stationed in sight of the manifold area at all times while the transfer is in progress. Important times whilst loading or unloading are during the starting up and finishing of the operation, involving topping off, the process of completing the loading of an individual tank or group of tanks to predetermined levels. The operation will take place according to company procedures, which will be based on internally agreed guidelines. The ullages will be frequently checked and careful records kept. Close liaison with the shore operator is vital, since loading must be slowed down and stopped at the right moment without producing any pressure shock in the system. During loading, the procedures will ask is the ullage of the loading tanks frequently checked and are empty tanks monitored to ensure that all closed valves are in fact oil tight? Is ample ullage space being left to avoid the possibility of oil spills? When the loading or unloading is complete, the loading arms and hoses will be drained, the manifold valve or valves closed and the loading arms or hoses blank flanged before being removed from the ship. Finally, it must be ensured that the valves of the system and all tank openings have been closed. After a further check to see that the deck is clean of oil, the scupper plugs can be removed. Cargo tank washing is an area which, as every seaman knows, is strictly controlled by rules and regulations that, by law, have to be adhered to. Nevertheless, tank washing is responsible for a considerable amount of pollution. In modern ships fitted with segregated ballast tanks, the water in the ballast tanks is kept completely separated from oil tanks. But in older ships, tank washing water is collected into slop tanks or cargo tanks dedicated as slop tanks. The oily mixtures from oily tanks, including dirty ballast, after decanting, can be discharged overboard, provided that all of the following conditions of Regulation 9 of Marpole 7383 Annex 1 are observed by the tanker. A. That the tanker is not within a special area. B. Is more than 50 nautical miles from the nearest land. C. Is proceeding en route. D. 
the instantaneous rate of discharge of oil content does not exceed 60 litres per nautical mile. During all these operations, including discharge of clean ballast, the oil discharge monitoring equipment, ODMI, should be used to make sure that the oil content is not greater than 100 parts per million during discharge of dirty ballast or oily mixtures from slop tanks, and not greater than 15 ppm during discharge overboard of clean ballast. If these limits cannot be maintained, the discharge is to be stopped and oily mixtures are to be retained aboard and discharged to shore reception facilities or by using load on top procedures. To avoid pollution and the problems legal and ecological, monitoring is essential and accurate records must be kept. These entered in the onboard record book must be maintained accurately and kept up to date as they're quite frequently checked by examining port state inspectors. Inaccurate statements can lead to prosecution. Marpol is concerned not only with oil, but with all forms of pollution, and has five annexes. These deal with oil, chemical tanker cargoes, packaged harmful substances, sewage and garbage. They also deal with the amounts of pollutant permitted to be discharged in different areas and annexes may prescribe special areas where disposal is prohibited. For the discharge of water which might contain traces of oil, these special areas cover the Baltic, Mediterranean, Black and Red Seas, the Gulf's area and the Gulf of Aden. Even more stringent regulations cover the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. Marpole annexes 1 and 2 are ratified by some 70 different countries, representing about 90% of worldwide tonnage. So far we've dealt with pollution from oil, but garbage is also a form of pollution dealt with by Marpole. Annex 5 covers all areas of Annex 1, and recently the North Sea and English Channel have been pronounced a special area for the discharge of garbage from ships. So let's now have some guidelines on this ever-present problem. From a pollution point of view, the worst substance among normal ship's waste is plastics, in one form or another. The main problem is that the majority of them are almost indestructible in the sea, and as a general rule they should not be put in the ship's incinerator, as they require extremely high temperatures to burn without producing dangerous fumes. The plastics are not always obvious. Bags, plates, beakers, cling film, plastic wrappings, and that kind of thing are obvious, but many packages are covered with a very thin film, so should go in the plastics bin. Plastics in the ocean are very dangerous to many sea creatures, by trapping them or by being swallowed. Since the permitted means of disposal of waste vary, it's best to keep different types of garbage separate. Plastics should be put into one bin, non-flammable material, such as bottles and cans, into another, and domestic garbage, such as paper, into a third. The use of paper bin liners for the collection of waste from cabins, mess rooms or galleys is very useful, because provided plastics are not put into the paper bags, such bags are readily disposed of over the side whilst the ship is away from shore and not in a restricted area. If uncertain, incineration in a suitable plant is the best remedy, but before using it, the instructions must be read and understood, especially when new crews are taking over. If there's no incinerator, or the one is unsuitable, the material should be kept in sealed plastic or strong paper bags for shore disposal. Dunnage and sweepings, other than oily materials or plastics, can be disposed of at sea at least 25 miles from shore, except in special areas where disposal is prohibited. The plastics and oily material must be dealt with, as we've previously said. Smoke emission from funnels is not a direct cause of major sea pollution, but it is a contributory cause of pollution of the atmosphere and a minor cause of sea pollution. If, however, black smoke is observed from on deck during normal operations, this should be reported to the engine room, 
as it may be an indication that an adjustment is necessary or something is not in order. The question of overall responsibility for following the correct procedures being carried out on board ship is a subject of some debate. The master is responsible for anything that may cause pollution derived from his vessel. However, if someone willfully or negligently causes illegal pollution, that seaman may be included in a criminal prosecution. The master's responsibility in such instances, or in any avoidable pollution at sea, is because it is his duty to ensure that members of his crew have been properly trained for the job they've been allocated. If there's any doubt about efficiency, the master must attempt to rectify matters. Fortunately, however, most problems are avoidable by having a good system and policy, good maintenance, good housekeeping, common sense, and motivation to do a job as well as possible. In practice, the necessary information on how to comply with principles of good ship practice is contained in the ship's operating manuals. For example, the ship's loading manual, the crude oil washing manual, and the prevention of oil pollution manual. There may also be other manuals specific to the ship. And of course, the ship will hold copies of MARPOL and relevant national regulations. And these manuals and publications should be available for members of the crew to read. Having seen this video and realizing what's involved and relatively how simple it would be to help reduce pollution, Ask yourselves, please, isn't it worth a little extra effort to keep our waters unpolluted? The beaches clean so that we and our children can enjoy splashing and swimming in the surf without fear of dirt and disease. And so that food from the sea will always be fit to eat. And so that the creatures of the sea don't have to suffer unnecessary horrible deaths. And let's not think only of the present, but for the future and our children's and their children's futures. It's not difficult, it just needs that little extra thought, concerted effort, individual effort, and good seamanship on the part of all at sea and those involved on shore. And if you don't make that concerted effort, you will have only yourselves to blame. The oceans are in your hands. Just think about it and act.